Hi, my name is John Gibbons, and I run a company called John Gibbons Body Master. And today, as part of the anatomy series, we're going to look at pathology of a disc. Uh, but first of all, we will discuss some of its anatomical uh, components. Think about the intervertebral disc. We have got 23 discs, but for this series, we're going to talk about the lumbar in particular. Then another series, I'll talk about cervical spine, and we'll discuss anatomy of a thoracic at a later date. But for this one, we've got the intervertebral disc that will separate each of the vertebra. And many people will come into the clinic and they say, I've got a slip disc, or they might have an MRI and say, I've got a prolapse disc. So let's just discuss the, the pros and cons of what people actually mean. Because the word slip disc is actually incorrect because the disc does not actually slip. The disc outer covering is actually known as the annulus fibrosis. And I try to relate it to a tube of toothpaste. If you think about a tube of toothpaste, you've got the outer, you can say the words like ceramic paint, if you want to call it that, but it's like a shell. It's like a hard sweet with a soft center. So this outer shell is known as the annulus. And then the, the water inside is known as the nucleus pulposus. So it's actually a fluid contained within the annulus that's going to move rather than the actual annulus slip in. No doubt the vertebra is able to move on an axis, okay, because it can bend and extend, as in flex and extend, and it can rotate, but we don't have much rotation. Even though typically the person might cough or sneeze, they might bend down to one side, so it's normally a compound movement, but we'll come back to that. But if, first of all, if you're looking at the outer cover in here, it's not quite true, this one. But for the demonstration and the discussion, we will just go through this process. The outer covering annulus, on the inside, if you were to look down at the disc, even though it's not here, this is the end plate of the vertebral body. But if you imagine you cut the tree in half and you look down, you will see circles to show the age. And then on this one, there is like one circle. But imagine, let's say you've got about 15 to 25 circles. And then on the inside, there's a bit of water, and that water would be the nucleus. So we've got almost like 15 to, let's say 20. We've got 20 circles, and they're called the lamella. And each circle, they go in opposing directions. So circle one is like this, circle two, circle three, and so on. And after 20 circles, you come to the center, and then that soft center suite will be directly in the middle. It's like saying you're in a maze. So we've all been in a maze. Okay, imagine someone says you have to find your way out, but instead of like an open, it's a door. So you're in like circle one and there's a door. So you open the door, so now you're in circle two. You walk around, yeah, you come to another door and eventually you open it and now you're in circle three. So slowly the fluid is migrating through each of the circles. Why? Typically, if we think of it as a tube of toothpaste again, now it's got a cap on it. A cap on, we unclick, we unclick. We unclick. Let's say we've got 20 clicks within the tube of toothpaste. But when we bend forward, so this is the anterior part, this is the posterior part. If we were to bend forward, i.e. we flex, you can notice in this case, but the, in this case, the disc is actually bulging or protruding or prolapsing. We'll discuss that in a second. So the fluid is coming to the posterior. At the back, there is a ligament called the posterior longitudinal ligament. And when the fluid hits the ligament, ouch, the back hurts. So to try to ease that, if we are bending forwards and we pick something up and our back hurts, it's very common for us to, to lean back. So the tube of toothpaste is pushing from the posterior now to the anterior. And what it does, it actually alleviates the pressure on the ligament because there's no pain receptors as such within the disc. So it's not the disc that's giving you pain. The disc will only give you pain when it touches that pain receptive, i.e. the ligament or more importantly, the nerves that exit. So like in this case, if this is L4 and this is L5, and then we are bending forward, remember the maze, the tube of fluid, it's in now circle number one to two to three to four, but when it slowly starts to come towards the end, let's say it's in the 15th circle, the fluid is coming, the end is like the, the tire, the, the tread is wearing down, and then the the pressure within the tire, you can see it bulging in, in certain areas. So you know that the tire is weakening on its wall. The disc is very similar. So by bending forward 
repeatedly, then that fluid is slowly wanting to bulge towards the end. For instance, if you've got a 10 kilogram weight here, it's 10 kilograms. If I extend my arms, it's approximately increases 10 times, give or take. So now we've got 100 kilograms that loads the lumbar spine. So by myself bending forward, and if I've got a weight in my arms and I'm reaching, it's not 10 kilograms anymore, it's now 100 kilogram load to the disc. And you wonder why you have that natural weakness within the wall. So by bending forward, the fluid starts to bulge. And then the next stage is that it starts to say, hi, and then it starts to almost protrude. In this case, if a nerve, in this case, this nerve would be the L4, this is L4 vertebra, this is L5, this is L4 exiting nerve root. So if our disc touches the exiting nerve root of L4, then you're gonna get dermatonal pain coming down to where the L4 nerve root supplies. If I was L5, then you might find you'll have pain down the L5, or if it's S1, you'll have pain typically in the plantar surface of the foot. If it's L5, it's normally the, affects the EHL, uh, as in extensor extends hallucis longus, and if it's L4, it will affect the function of the tibialis anterior, but many other muscles as well. But we can do neuroanatomy at another point. But today, it can start off as a bulge, then it can protrude, and then the next stage is that now it starts to extrude, so it comes out a bit more, and then extrusion to a protrusion into a prolapse. They're almost like, some would call it, they are similar. And then also a herniated disc will also be classified as a prolapsed disc as well. They call it like a PID, pro, uh, prolapsed intervertebral disc. And once the fluid is now out, if it does happen to contact the nerve, you will more than likely have neurological pain you know, or radiation, as in sciatic type of pain, buttock, back of leg, knee, you know, anterior, posterior shin, all the way down, depending on what nerve root is contact. The fluid can actually break off. And if it breaks off, it's actually called a sequestration. So now the disc is sequestered. So now the fluid is now separate from its attachment. The strange thing about discs is that because it's part of the natural environment, when the disc leaves its natural environment, the body thinks it's a foreign body and then will start to attack it. And that's why you might find you damage the disc. You might not initially get the nerve pain. You think, oh, I've damaged my back because I bent and oh, my back is a bit sore. A day or two later, typically the second day, you might notice this weird, sharp, shooting, stabbing pain in the leg. And you think, oh, wow, I've got sciatica. But it happened a day or two later. Why? Potentially, it's because of the inflammatory response. The fluid is now left its natural environment. The body thinks, oh, it's foreign, let's attack it. And now it starts to swell. Because the space is very small where it exits, the pressure obviously affects the nerve root. And then that's why you might feel the pain coming down the leg. It's a tricky one. Most discs tend to, within two to three months, settle down. The disc can get reabsorbed. Typically, you'll have an MRI to confirm that. Um, sometimes or rarely you might need surgery to remove the pressure on the nerve root, but most of the time they do tend to settle down. Today is not really part of what we can do about it. Today is more about discussing the disc and its anatomy, and then the stages of a bulge to a protrusion, to an extrusion, to a prolapse, to a sequestered disc. So it doesn't actually slip. It's actually a fluid within those laminar concentric rings that's migrating out. The tube of toothpaste, you've unclicked and unclicked, and eventually the cap is off, and the fluid is now free to ooze, and no doubt the nerve is next to it, and when it contacts the nerve, that's where you'll get the, the typical sciatic pain. And there we have anatomy of a disc and the relationship to the um, pathology.